talk by our visiting professor, uh, Julianne Graper. Uh, in order to uh, just give you a little introduction to um, the DIRT project, uh, I have on hand here a, a very nice um, uh, PowerPoint that was prepared by uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Sue Tui. And so um, let me um, let me bring that up. Uh, so let's just uh, just a few slides here, which will be an efficient way to um, to get us uh, acquainted a little bit with the diverse environmentalism's research team, DIRT. Uh, and as you can see here, we find ourselves uh, at the intersection of expressive culture, the environment, and ecological change. And this is an initiative that comes uh, straight out of our Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology. Uh, the DIRT project highlights the diverse environmentalisms of groups throughout the world, the diverse systems of belief and practice that shape the ways people conceive of, interact with, and manage their surroundings. And here's just a little summary of some, some of the things that we've been up to over the last uh, few years. Uh, we had an academic symposium here back in uh, March of 2017, and you can see over here to the right, upper right, the wonderful assembly of erudite people that uh, participated in, uh, in the symposium. We've done a number of sponsored talks, performances, and academic panels. We have designed new courses, some of which uh, you, uh, the students in our group here, uh, probably have already experienced. Uh, we have created museum exhibits and music videos. We have promoted individual and collaborative research, and we have in press at the University of Illinois, Performing Environmentalism's Expressive Culture and Ecological Change, which is a collection of papers uh, produced out of our symposium, uh, and of course expanded uh, from those drafts. Uh, so you can see we've been active here and there. For more information, uh, we have our website here, so you can uh, look that up, uh, Dirt Indiana. And if you would like to be on, on the Dirt distribution list and receive notices of upcoming events, you can send an email to our Dirt graduate assistant who is present today. I noticed Isaiah is here, Isaiah Green, and there is Isaiah's email connection. Okay, so... Uh, before I uh, get, get uh, to introducing Julianne, just let me express a, a word of thanks to the COLCOM, that is the, in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology, Fernando and Barbara in particular. Also, uh, a, a word of thanks to, to Michelle, uh, been helpful in uh, organizing this event. And uh, furthermore, uh, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the work that Isaiah is doing with us uh, and with the DIRT project. All right, well, let me just briefly introduce our speaker so we can get on with uh, what she has to show. So we have uh, Dr. Julianne Graper. She comes to us from the University of Texas, which is a wonderful place, by the way, happens to be my uh, alma mater, the place that where I uh, my PhD a little while back. And uh, her uh, dissertation, which is a very fresh one, uh, just 2019, uh, is uh, entitled Bat People, Multispecies Ethnography in Austin TX and Chiapas MX, Austin, Texas and Chiapas, Mexico. She also has a master's degree from the University of Oregon, where I noticed that she has worked with Nueva Trova Cubana, which is probably not a topic that we'll hear very much about today, but Juliana, I would like to talk to you about that topic another time. And I'm I'm imagining that you might have worked with our um, uh, our friend and former student Juan Eduardo, and it wouldn't surprise me. And uh, uh, Julianne has her bachelor's degree from Whitman College in biology, so it's uh, 
surely a useful foundation for the the work that uh, that that she's doing now. Freshly minted, uh, Julianne has already published uh, chapters in some uh, very significant collections of uh, of essays. Uh, she's done some translations of South American, Latin American, or let's say Spanish American uh, work, and that's an extremely important function to make a connection across uh, the Americas in this way. And um, and she's done a book reviews as well. well. Although I don't view in the Journal of Folklore Research reviews, uh, so that's something that we'll have to remedy uh, going forward. So uh, Julianne's work troubles the nature culture divide and ultimately ask the question, what does it mean to be human? So let's get into a little bit of that today. Her talk today is uh, titled, Bats in the Human-Animal Borderlands. Without further ado, and normally we would all be applauding, so why don't we all applaud Julianne and welcome her. And thank you, Julianne, for uh, sharing your work with us today. Great, thank you so much for the introduction and for having me here to talk about about this stuff. I'm excited. Um, also, thank you so much for being on the internet when it's beautiful outside. Hopefully we won't, we won't be too long um, and then everyone can get back to doing that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Video, it's about two minutes long. Eating a bat calls the Chinese flu, but don't knock it if you try it is my message to you. I eat them flying rodents and I get a lot of flack, but once you go bat, you never go back. You may think I'm some sort of ghoul, but I'm just a man who's a bat eating fool. I eat that bat all over this town. You can find me sleeping, hanging upside down. I like girl scrugs, but I prefer Lester Flat. I like a T-bone steak, but I love me a bat. I never was much of a heavy metal dude, but me and Ozzy Osbourne got the same taste in food. old bat at the taco bell they fly out the window like bats out of hell try a little bat you're in for a treat that's why we call it the other black meat in georgia they gave me a 10 gallon hat first man ever ate a 10 gallon bat when normal folks go hungry they go to a dunkin when i get hungry i go spelunkin Pardon the pun with some coleslaw on a sesame bun. With all this trouble, I won't eat a bat, so that should answer how I got so fat. I'm like Trump, the way he gets grouchy when he's corrected by Dr. Fauci. In this video, Posted to YouTube on March 29th, comedian Norm Macdonald addresses the theory that the COVID-19 pandemic was caused as a result of bushmeat eating practices in China. Macdonald, an outspoken conservative, has in the past been lauded by the Federalists for his brave lampooning of political correctness. The online news outlet cites Macdonald's criticisms of the Me Too movement for its, quote, potential to harm the innocent, end quote, his ability to mock while simultaneously supporting conservative politicians like Bob Dole, and his support of George W. Bush, the George W. Bush administration's stance on the Iraq war. Less viewers think his pol political orientation has shifted as a result of the novel coronavirus and its potential origins. Norm Macdonald's bat song treats the COVID-19 pandemic with the same insensitivity. The black and white video is notable not just for indexing life during the pandemic, note the prominently placed bottle of Purell hand sanitizer, but also for its overt racialization of bats and bat eating practices. The opening lyric, eating a bat caused a Chinese flu, places blame on China for instigating transmission of the viral disease, as well as mimics controversial statements made by President Donald Trump throughout the progress of the pandemic. 
The very image of McDonald making a sandwich out of what is supposedly bat meat pokes fun at animal consumption practices by making them seem out of place in his stereotypical American home. In fact, the very foundation on which this humor is based through unexpected comparison positions bushmeat eating practices as weird, unusual, and barbaric. Furthermore, it references a long history of racist stereotypes about Asians involving both animal consumption practices and menacing sickliness. McDonald also racializes the bat itself through a similar um, juxtapositional aesthetic, most notably by re uh, replacing bat for black in phrases like, once you go bat, you never go back. This substitution is surprisingly common and perhaps indicative of the ways that non-human animals are used to index racial others across a broad variety of cultural milieu. Horror films involving bats as uncontrollable invaders have been dubbed bat exploitation films in some scholarship, highlighting the synecdical use of bats to represent misplaced anxieties about racial others. During my dissertation fieldwork, I interviewed Bevis Griffin, the self-proclaimed Black Rock Maverick of Texas, who cited a passage in a book which used the term bat as a racial slur as one of the inspirations for his self-consciously critical 1980s band, The Bats. Another group that I interviewed, The Bat City Surfers, titled their first album, Fear of a Bat Planet, referencing Public Enemy's 1990 Fear of a Black Planet, Planet excuse me, in a tongue-in-cheek move that also addressed the parallels between racialized others and non-human animals in horroristic fiction. The use of bats to represent racial others has a long history in Western culture, tracing to representations of Lucifer in biblical paintings, as well as colonial fictions represented in vampire literature. The COVID-19 pandemic, however, demonstrates a shift in such racialization, moving away from metaphorical comparison to blame based on animal consumption practices. Glenn Elder, Jennifer Walsh, and Jody Emel have examined similar cases in the 1980s and 90s, in which the consumption or mistreatment of animals was used as a key site of negotiation over which cultures counted as human. Practices deemed barbaric, ranging from dog fighting to ritual sacrifice in Santeria, were used as excuses for overt discrimination as plaintiffs decried animal cruelty without examining similarly cruel practices common, if not pervasive, in Western culture. In the same edited volume, Walsh and Emil conceptualized the sites where the humans come uneasily into contact with non-humans as borderland spaces. Nowhere are these borderland spaces more visible than in the geographies of the COVID-19 pandemic. Zoonotic diseases passed from non-humans to humans irreparably trouble the existence of species boundaries, questioning the physical delimitations of human bodies and by extension, human personhood. In this talk, I will briefly address some theoretical considerations regarding the function of bats in destabilizing that boundary, drawing from some of my dissertation fieldwork in Austin, Texas. I will then examine how long-standing cultural associations between bats and disease come to bear on current discussions about bats and COVID-19, particularly questioning the way that bats and bat-eating practices have been mobilized in anti-China rhetoric in the media and by the Trump administration. While Walsh and Emel focus on specific geographical locales in their analysis, the global scale of the COVID-19 pandemic and its attendant alterations to human mobility demonstrate that such interspecies relations are, in fact, everywhere. In fact, we can understand the blurred boundaries between humans and non-humans as not simply incidental to the COVID-19 pandemic, but its defining feature. The significance of human-non-human -human relations during the COVID-19 pandemic are evident in the discourses we mobilize to understand the disease and its origins, as well as the ways we demarcate racialized persons and non-persons during this time. Yeah. Understanding the emergence of bat-human discourses in the COVID-19 era relies on understanding their historical roots. Representations of bats as ungodly, unclean, and unpalatable in Western culture are traceable to the Bible. The Book of Baruch, canonical for Catholics and in some Christian sects, contains a warning about false idols, which are described as figures shrouded in smoky temples covered in bats, birds, and cats. The presence of bats is evidence of the idol's non-Christian status, as the text proclaims, by this ye may know that they are no gods. Additionally, Leviticus contains specific injunctions against the consumption of bats, which are included in the list of unclean birds. It states, among the fowls, they shall not be eaten, they are an abomination, the eagle and the ossifrage and the osprey, the stork, the heron, and the bat. 
Representations of bats as evil or immoral were further codified through depictions of Lucifer with bat wings. Art historian Tessa Laird points out that though the Bible itself does not describe what Lucifer's wings look like, bat-like appendages became associated with the devil through Western art. An early example is the 1356 painting Fall of the Rebel Angels by an anonymous artist shown on the left. Others include Gustave Doré's illustration for Milton's Paradise Lost in the center and Francisco Goya's The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters on the right, both of which helped to solidify depictions of the devil as having bat wings. Laird points out that such depictions were so impactful that when Captain Cook saw a flying fox when he landed in Australia in 1770, he declared that he encountered a real life devil. Negative associations with bats became solidified with the European conquest of the Americas as evident in associations between bats and vampires. On his arrival in the West Indies in the early 16th century, Spanish chronicler Gonzalo Fernando de Oviedo described vampire bats detailing how they, quote, suck such a great amount of blood from the wound that it is difficult to believe unless one has observed it, unquote, and how, quote, they were very dangerous to Christians. At the time of the conquest of Darien, some Christians died of it and others were critically ill, unquote. Taken in context of the rest of his description of bats, these claims are actually relatively accurate, referring to the anticoagulant in vampire bat saliva, fittingly named Draculin, that makes feeding for them easier, and the very real possibilities of infection and disease in bat bites that had not been appropriately sterilized. However, as translations of Oviedo's accounts became widely popular in Europe in the 1550s, we can assume that claims about a great amount of blood that could kill Christians were blown out of proportion as the bats came to be associated with vampire lore already existing in Europe. The associations between bats and vampires continue to be pervasive, as evidenced by this image, taking taken at Blooming Foods East last Sunday. Vampire's associations with bats became codified with Bram Stoker's 1897 novel Dracula. In fact, an anecdotal theory suggests that Stoker may have added bats to his story after reading Oviedo's accounts of bats in the New World. Prior to the rise of liter the literary vampire, however, folkloric accounts of vampires existed across Europe that were very much unlike the stereotypical vampire we've come to know today. While some accounts do involve shape-shifting, it is more often in the form of a dog or a cat and can even include animals as wide-ranging as a wolf, horse, donkey, frog, or butterfly. Similarly, vampires were more often said to smother their victims while they slept rather than biting them and sucking their blood. According to Bill Wasik and Monica Murphy, the rise of animalistic vampires as codified in Dracula has expressed European anxieties particular to the 19th century, not about bats themselves, but about the native inhabitants of the Americas, who were perceived to be backward, animalistic, and not quite human. In the 20th century, these fears became codified in ways that reflected fears about invasion from cultural and racial others, a rich and complicated topic for another time, unfortunately. Literary depictions of vampires and their associated codes have had real effects on public perceptions of bats as well as policy. The case of Austin, Texas is a classic example. In the early 1980s, the downtown Congress Avenue bridge underwent reconstruction that included the addition of three quarter inch wide by 16 inch deep expansion joints, which were unexpectedly ideal for Mexican free tail bat roosting. Here's a quick look at what that bat colony looks like today. By 1984, hundreds of thousands of bats had colonized the Congress Avenue Bridge, leading to public outcry. Petitions were circulated to eradicate the colony, local officials declared a public health crisis, and newspapers ran headlines with sensational language that mimicked the language of vampire stories and horror films. Bat colonies sink teeth into city and mass fear in the air as bats invade Austin. Like the horror tropes that they were derived from, Austinites' fears of invading bats reflected racial prejudices, particularly against immigrants. It is no accident that immigration reform became a major topic in the U.S. politics of the early 1980s, precisely at the time that these cultural depictions and their real-life counterparts came to the surface. Anat Singh has demonstrated a similar phenomenon with so-called Africanized bees, which were not only described using racialized language in public media, 
but attempts were made to physically bar them from entering the country by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's construction of a barrier across the Texas-Mexico border. Singh describes a combination of, quote, fears of Mexican immigrants creeping over inadequately patrolled borders and fears of black-white racial miscegenation, end quote. Unlike many other cases, the story of Austin's bridge bats is, has a happy ending, largely due to the efforts of biologist Merlin Tuttle and his organization, Bat Conservation International. The city now generates an estimated $12 million annual income through ecotourism from visitors coming to see the bats. Images of bats are now featured on purchasable souvenirs, the facade of music venues, and posters. The official drink of Austin, determined in an annual competition as a part of the city's summer bat fest, is the Batini. And in the late 1980s, Mayor Lee Cook declared Austin the bat capital of America. Gothic stories have had real life effects on our understanding of medical issues as well. Sari alt Schooler has demonstrated the impact of Gothic narratives both on uh, describing pandemic diseases and on the medical practices that ensued. Beginning with Justice Heckler's 1832 work, The Black Death in the 14th Century, which sparked the use of historical pandemics as tools for understanding pre present day health issues, alt Schooler describes how literary genre conventions, in particular, avoiding the description of particular bodily functions, impacted Victorian understandings of how disease was transmitted, and as a result, the actions that were taken to mitigate its spread. These approaches have formed the basis of how global health policies are currently enacted. Nancy Tomes has also demonstrated a continuity between periods of germ panic and periods of increased anxiety over immigration in the United States that mimic Austin's fears about invading bats. Charting concerns over germs from 1900 to 1940, and in the 80s and 90s, Tomes claims that, quote, both germ panics coincided with periods of heavy immigration to the United States of groups perceived as alien and difficult to assimilate, and that they reflected anxieties about so, uh, societal incorporation associated with expanding markets, transportation networks, and mass immigration, end quote. As with bats, cultural fears about invading others were expressed through non-human others. However, as we've already seen, Associations between bats, disease, and invasion are not simply parallel narratives, but are rooted in pre-existing cultural narratives. The reach of these narratives is expansive. Bats have been blamed for diseases ranging from Ebola, SARS, MERS, rabies, Nipah virus, Hantavirus, and more recently, COVID-19. At this time, claims that bats are the origin of COVID-19 remain in the realm of speculation. No patient zero has been identified, and as such, the origins of the virus remain unclear. Some sources suggest that the virus jumped to humans from an intermediate source, most likely a pangolin, while others suggest that the virus could have entered humans as a harmless microbe and mutated while there. Still others suggest the possibility of livestock as potential hosts. As with Ebola, Researchers look to bats as a potential origin of the novel coronavirus based on existing research that bats have been known to harbor coronaviruses, plural. Researchers do agree that the virus originated in an animal host and that an ancestral form of the virus probably developed in bats. However, to date, SARS-CoV-2 virus itself has not been isolated in bats. Instead, scientists have only identified a highly genetically similar coronavirus in bats. Genetic similarity does not mean the same virus, however. As a reference, Bat Conservation Trust Conservation Services head Lisa Warledge points out that human beings and chimpanzees are 96% similar genetically, and yet we are completely different animals. Conservationists claim that disproportionate sampling of bats as disease hosts are largely to blame for the overemphasis on bats in the media. In an op-ed written in late March, Merlin Tuttle pointed out that in some studies examining potential sources of the SARS pandemic, bats were sampled nearly twice as much as other species. Additionally, because bats are easy to sample in large numbers, they are attractive experimental subjects because scientists are able to publish their results more quickly. The number of epidemiological studies on bats propagates exponentially as scientists seek out species that they think are likely to, to transmit the disease based on the results of previous studies. Additionally, the claim that bats can be asymptomatic carriers of disease is based on erroneous findings. A study conducted in the 1950s examined rabies transmission from infected bats to mice. The bats showed no symptoms, but the mice died, leading to the supposition that bats could be disease carriers without actually falling ill. 
However, it was later uncovered that the bats had not had rabies at all, but rather a kind of Rio Bravo virus that is deadly to mice, but harmless to both bats and humans. While bats can carry rabies and like other wild animals should not be handled except by a professional, they have no higher instances of rabies than other urban wildlife. Nonetheless, they have become the poster children for rabies. The assumption that bats can be asymptomatic carriers of diseases like rabies has led to speculation about why bats can carry diseases like coronaviruses without getting sick. Some scientists claiming that their higher internal body temperature helps them to combat disease more effectively than humans. However, such claims remain hotly debated among scientists. Similarly, bats have been conflated with other diseases and their attendant racist connotations. Sarah Monson describes how Ebola, another disease attributed to the consumption of bats, was manipulated in mainstream media to reflect and encourage otherized thinking about Africans, particularly through accusations about eating bats. The Ebola epidemic demonstrated a cultural double standard that led to racial blaming of Africans as the cause of the epidemic. Monson cites a cover story by Newsweek that portrays African bushmeat as a potential Ebola carrier and a threat to the United States. It was criticized, quote, for both its racializing associations of primates with Africans and its depiction of bushmeat, a West African delicacy, which the article calls a cultural touchstone. Monson claims, quote, Americans also consume bushmeat but call it venison and game referring to the consumption of bushmeat as a cultural, as cultural, but framing as exotic, dirty, devious, and other perpetuates the dark continent myth of Africa and reinforces xenophobia towards Africans and African immigrants, end quote. Monson's work reinforces claims made by cultural geographers, Glenn Elder, Jennifer Walsh, and Jody Emel, who claim that, quote, conflicts over animal practices rooted in deep-seated cultural beliefs and social norms fuel ongoing efforts to racialize and devalue certain groups of immigrants. Animal practices have thus become tools of a cultural imperialism designed to delegi delegitimize subjectivity and citizenship of immigrants under time-space conditions of post-modernity and social relations of post-coloniality." End quote. Such racialization became even more obvious in the COVID-19 pandemic as theories about disease originating in a Wuhan wild animal market emerged. However, some early COVID cases were found not to have been linked to the wild animal market at all, begging the question as to whether or not that was the site of the first spillover to humans. While wild animal markets have a high potential for viral contamination due to their close quarters in which animals are placed, there is no direct evidence that COVID-19 first appeared there. The public claim that bats are the cause of COVID-19 is therefore a clear case of conflating correlation and causation. Furthermore, public outcries against these markets, while ignoring the possibility of transmission via farm animals or other points of human-animal contact, underlie the belief that backwards practices of eating bushmeat were evidence of Chinese guilt and complicity in the spread of the virus. Accusations of Chinese guilt intensified with President Donald Trump's propagation of a theory that the virus originated in the lab of Xi Zhengli, principal investigator at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. In a briefing from April 30th, President Trump answered in the affirmative to whether he had seen convincing evidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the source of the virus, but declined to offer what that evidence was. Dr. Xi, on the other hand, wrote in Wuhan's main Communist Party newspaper in February that she could guarantee on her life that the virus hadn't come from her lab. She continued to, quote, advise those who believe and spread malicious rumors to close their stinky mouths, end quote as she mostly does genetic sequencing with computers, and that when she has used samples from bats to culture viruses, she didn't use the COVID-19 virus. The paper that initially suggested that the virus came from Dr. Xi's lab was withdrawn after its speculation caught international attention. President Trump's use of the term Chinese virus against advice from the CDC and the World Health Organization reflects the yellow peril politics of the 19th century. German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm II is credited with popularizing the concept, joking fears about European countries being overrun by yellow-skinned invaders. A similar concept in the United States, Asian, met ah, excuse me, Asian menace theory, led labor unions to lobby for the exclusion of Chinese workers on the claim that they had viruses that were more potent than the ones harbored by Caucasians, eventually leading to the 1882 China Exclusion Act. Such associations between Asians and disease continued. A 1954 article in the New York Tribune claimed, quote, 
they are uncivilized, unclean, filthy beyond all conception, without any of the higher domestic or social relations, lustful and sensual in all their disp dispositions, every female is a prostitute and of the basest order." End quote. Such racist epithets have rapidly proliferated, virus-like, in the COVID-19 pandemic. The comment section of Norm Macdonald's bat song makes them readily apparent. One user wrote, quote, wow, Chinese virus is extremely offensive and racist. Even the GOP will tell you that the correct term is Kung Flu, although Rudy Giuliani prefers Mulan cooties, end quote. This comment received 68 likes, followed by a list of other racist puns on COVID-19, including slant AIDS, referencing stereotypes of Asian eye shape, CCP virus in reference to the Chinese Communist Party, yellow fever two epidemic boogaloo, referencing the racist stereotype of Asian skin color, the Chinese sneeze, and the Shanghai shivers. Some users also wrote their own additional verses to the song, some of which made the racist Chinese bat parallel even more apparent. One user wrote, quote, I like to eat bat in a stew with dog meat. Now that's a combination that's impossible to beat. Anger is spreading like a global shockwave, but here in Wuhan, it's just the chicken of the cave, end quote, mentioning the racist stereotype that Chinese people eat dogs. In addition to racist discourse, news media have reported increases in hate crimes against Asian Americans. On July 2nd, CBS News reported 2,120 anti-Asian hate incidents, mostly occurring in California. The incidents ranged from verbal abuse to physical assault. In a report from ABC, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania is quoted as saying, quote, we didn't see a spike in anti-Asian violence until President Trump started saying Wuhan virus, China virus, end quote. The racism was not confined to the United States, however, as evidenced by the emergence of je ne suis pas un virus, I am not a virus, hashtag in France in February. The racist blaming of China as a source of the novel coronavirus has been made more, evident in, uh, more than evident in recent news media. What has been less often discussed is the use of bat consumption practices not only as evidence of allegedly backward cultural practices in China, but as scientific proof of China's guilt in cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we've seen throughout this talk, not only, not only are claims about bats as originators of COVID-19 scientifically suspect at best, they are rooted in longstanding cultural discourses about bats as disease carriers and as analogous to racial others. The scaling of bats as part of anti-China rhetoric during the pandemic is not accidental. It demonstrates how racist narratives persist through time in a combination of oblique and overt representations. Circling back to the title of this talk, Walton Emil's construction of geographical borderlands where species meet is a useful tool for examining specific instances of animal-human interaction. However, the COVID-19 pandemic calls into question the utility of examining human-animal relations only in certain geographical spaces. Rather, the global spread of the virus, along with narratives about its alleged animal origin, trouble the possibility that we can ever have been separate from other species. Moreover, the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates how our relationships with non-human others act as key sites of negotiation by which we determine not only our own through both metaphorical parallels and disputes over cultural practices that articulate proper maintenance of species boundaries, how we relate to non-humans ultimately determines how we relate to other humans. Thank you.